Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Beckwith. Today, James Hansen's landmark paper called Global Warming in the Pipeline was just published by Oxford Open Climate Change. Um, and it, uh, it's open source. You can just Google the title and uh, it made a lot of news today. Now, parts of it have been previously um, talked about a lot in letters um, and other articles that, that James Hansen has often posted frequently on his website over the last number of months as the ideas behind this paper were, um, were, were uh, you know, tossed about and developed by, by Hansen and his colleagues. It's a complex paper. Um, there's no denying that, but it is vitally important. And it really does explain why and how global warming has greatly accelerated recently. Now, I'll tell you already that there will be pushback in the mainstream media. I think there is actually some, I'll show you a little bit, from so-called go-to climate scientists that the media use, such as Michael Mann. And of course, he's going to say, oh, you know, global warming hasn't accelerated, and he'll give a quote, and he'll push, he'll flog his, his book, right? He'll give link, you know, and, you know, this is, this is getting <laughs> absurdly ridiculous. Um, you know, the so-called mainstream scientists are acting a bit like clowns right now um, and to the detriment of of the planet, to the detriment of people. I mean, by their, their reticence and their um, nonsense that's going on has just got to stop. They have to look at the data and address all the points that Hansen's pointed out in his paper and look out their windows because warming has greatly accelerated and we're heading to a much, much warmer planet. So I'm going to talk about the details of this paper. So the video, I'll apologize in advance. It might be a little bit long. Um, hopefully it's somewhat semi-coherent in the way I present um, this information. And like I say, I Hansen has talked about, you know, different aspects of it in great detail and I've done videos on it in the past um, on it. So this is the paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline. Um, before I get into it, um, of course, this is James Hansen. Yep, you don't know too much about him. Then, um, you know, just uh, search and read up about him. And so there's a lot of stuff here, you know, he's back with another dire climate warm, warm warning and there's lots of top stories um just breaking today you know within the last number of hours on his um on his work okay and it's vitally important this is his uh website at columbia there's not links to the november 2nd report yet um but there is i i, my, I did do a video on this article and also on this one here, but not on one from a couple weeks ago or, or a couple weeks after the October 13th. So, so just last week, I haven't talked about that one and it's relevant to the present paper. So let's talk about it. <coughs> Excuse me, this cough. Okay. So in Hanson's book, In Storms of My Grandchildren, awesome book, 2009, I can't believe it was published so long ago. Would have thought it would be more recent but there's professor faustus contemplating the benefits of a bargain with mephistopheles okay humans have made their own faustian bargain by aerosol cooling to offset global warming and the idea of a faustian bargain if you like faust in the legend traded his soul to the devil in exchange for knowledge so to strike a Faustian bargain is to be willing to sacrifice anything to satisfy a limitless desire for knowledge or power. You know, deal with the devil. It's a cultural motif. Um, <coughs> the term a deal with the devil or Faustian bargain 
is also used metaphorically to condemn a person or persons perceived as having cooperated with an evil entity or it's a Faustian bargain, it's an agreement in which a person <coughs> abandons his or her spiritual values or moral principles in order to obtain knowledge, wealth, or some other gain. So it's, it's very interesting just to look at this expression and see where, where it came from. <coughs> okay, so global warming in the pipeline. He's talking about the paper that just was published in Oxford Open Climate Change of Oxford University Press, OUP. So the paper describes an alternate, alternative perspective on global climate change, alternative to that of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which provides scientific evidence on climate change to the UN. The paper may be read as being critical of the IPC, IPCC, but there's no criticism of individual scientists who include world-leading researchers volunteering their time to produce IPCC reports. But what they're doing is they're questioning whether the IPCC procedure and project yield the advice that the public, especially young people, need to understand to protect their home planet. Okay, so a couple of key things is these papers and previous ones by Hansen, they used a three-pronged analysis. Now, the IPCC work, it leans heavily, sometimes exclusively, on GCMs, the global climate models, much too heavily. <coughs> and I agree with that. I mean, that's what he says. I agree totally. I mean, the models are always... Things are always happening faster than expected, and the expected is what the models are generally producing. Um, we prefer a comparable weight on one. So, so the three-pronged approach is one, use information from Earth's paleoclimate history. For example, look at the last glacial maximum, look at the temperature that the temperature dropped on the planet Earth, look at the change in the radiative forcing, <coughs> and then get a climate sensitivity from that, not from um, theory. Also uses the global climate models, you know, with equal weight. <coughs> and also uses observations of ongoing climate processes and climate change. So this three-pronged approach can result in rather complex papers, but so too is the real world complex. So the, this is used as three-pronged approach in both the heavily peer-reviewed paper, Ice Melt, Sea Level Rise and Superstorms that was published in 2016, and in the present paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline. Okay, so there's the two key papers, Ice Melt and Pipeline. Now, the Ice Melt paper, um, it used the three-pronged approach, which differed from that of the IPCC, um, and it got a terrible, it had a terrible fate. It was basically, it wasn't incorporated into the, um, the IPCC reports and many mainstream climate scientists poo-pooed it and said, well, this can't be right. It's too dire or it's too, you know, and it's turned out to be very, very accurate. So we don't want that fate for this paper pipeline because the world is running short on time to develop a strategy to preserve a propitious climate for today's young people and their children. So climate change today is driven by two large human-made climate forcings. One, everybody knows about the greenhouse gases, but the second one that's vital to know about is the aerosols, the fine airborne particles, which result in visible air pollution when they're present in sufficient amount. Aerosol climate forcing results in part from the effect of the aerosols themselves on incoming solar radiation. They block some of the incoming solar radiation, reduce the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth's surface and being absorbed. So they, they cause some cooling, that's a direct effect. But the main effect from the effect of the aerosols is the indirect effect because the aerosols act as condensation nuclei for cloud droplets to form on. <coughs> and when there's lots of aerosols, there's lots of small droplets formed. So if there's more aerosols, there's smaller cloud drops because the water supply of water vapor is limited, so that so therefore the clouds are brighter, therefore they're higher reflectivity, and they live longer, thus increasing global 
cloud cover. They live longer because the water droplets are very, very small. And in order for a cloud to rain out, the droplets have to converge and join each other and get larger and larger and they eventually overcome <coughs> the, um, basically gravitate, gravity pulls them down when they're large enough. The measurement of aerosol climate forcing requires precise global monitoring of cloud and aerosol microphysics. Whether NASA would measure the aerosol climate forcing was a very contentious issue beginning in the late 1980s because the observations required sampling of the seasonal and daily cycles of cloud cover that could best be achieved from a pair of relatively inexpensive small satellites called CLIMSAT. But this proposal was not deemed to be competitive with NASA plans for its Earth observing system, so it wasn't done. So aerosol climate forcing has not been monitored and aerosol forcing is in effect a free parameter in climate models. It can be tweaked. And this is a big problem because this is really has a huge effect on what people determine in the models for climate sensitivity. Without accurate knowledge of aerosol forcing, a wide range of climate sensitivities are consistent with observed global warming during the past century a small climate sensitivity requires rather little aerosol cooling to match the observed warming, but a larger climate sensitivity combined with greater aerosol cooling is also consistent with observed global warming. <coughs> so in, in the latest paper, we obtain an indirect inference on aerosol climate forcing by a well-defined knowledge of climate sensitivity from paleoclimate and accurate satellite measurements of the Earth energy imbalance. It's crucial that the precise measuring of Earth's radiation budget continue. If NASA is not going to do it, the European Space Agency needs to take up the challenge. Otherwise, <coughs> today's young people truly will be up. SXXT, crick, with, without a, up the creek without a paddle. Up a certain creek, an SXXT creek in any efforts to understand continued global temperature change and guide climate <coughs> and energy policies. Sorry, I need my coffee. Pipeline. So this paper basically uses paleoclimate analysis. It shows, the key thing is it shows that climate sensitivity is higher than IPCC's best estimate. So IPCC best estimate is three degrees Celsius for doubled CO2. Okay, uh, the, the pipeline shows that it's 4.8 degrees Celsius, plus or minus 1.2. So it could be anywhere from 3.6 to 6 degrees um, Celsius. Okay, so much, much larger, well outside the error bounds of the 3 degrees Celsius. This is a double whammy because the higher sensitivity implies that the aerosol effect is underestimated by the IPCC. So in addition to higher climate sensitivity, the Faustian payments that come due as we clean up air pollution are greater. In the, in the absence of measurements of aerosol climate forcing, the magnitude of the observed change of Earth's radiation budget in the regions of heavy ship traffic indicates that aerosol models are likely underestimating the effect of aerosols on clouds. Okay, and I've talked about that in some in my videos on some of James Hansen's previous letters, which are incorporated into this um, paper. So guidance for climate policy. Guidance for global energy and climate policies is also hindered by over-reliance on models. Science has not informed policymakers well about the prospects of ongoing climate change, as evidenced by claims that targets for limiting global warming can still be achieved by a realistic phase down of emissions. So this is a complete fiction. It's like unicorns and rainbows, you know, try to stay below 1.5. There's no possible way, you know, we're approaching, you know, over the next year, we're gonna be, end up probably being over 1.5 for the entire year with exceedance of two degrees uh, within, a, within a few decades on. So the policymakers on 1.5 and 2, it's a pipe dream. And not only that, but their 1.5 and 2 degrees are based on the 1880 to 1920 roughly baseline, which is 
Originally, those numbers, when, when they were talked about, it was relative to the 1750 baseline. So that baseline shift means you need to really add 0.2 or 0.3 degrees Celsius to all these temperatures. So where it puts us well, well above 1.5 and, you know, very closely approaching 2 if you use the 1750 baseline. So, so there's nefarious stuff on going on as well. Um, so it's basically, it's, there's unrealistic assumptions in the integrated assessment models. They assume that we can remove lots of carbon with magic technologies, which we don't have. And they assume there's low sensitivity in the climate, you know, from the climate models. So anyway, these conclusions of that approach are falsified by pipelines. So basically the UN IPCC has it all wrong. Mainstream scientists have it all wrong. You know, you really need to pay attention to what Hansen is, is doing with his, with, his, with his awesome work. The reluctance of IPCC, the body providing specific scientific guidance to the UN to provide technical advice is disappointing. And he says, you know, buried in the thousands of pages of IPCC reports is a conclusion that nuclear power has the smallest carbon and environmental footprint, footprint among the major source of energy. You know, it's long been understood by energy experts that in the absence of nuclear power, fossil fuels would have to provide the 24-7 electricity generation essential to complement intermittent renewable energy. Right? They don't, they don't recom recommend technologies that would really help. I mean, what, what's their purpose? The report. Leave it up to the policymakers. Also, scientific reticence is a very important key topic that Hansen's often talked about. It's also in pipeline. Um, an example is the ice melt paper. The concluding words of the title of the ice melt paper were, two degrees C global warming is highly dangerous. The paper was heavily peer reviewed by four referees and by the wider community via the open review process. One of the four referees, an IPCC lead author, had strong objections to the paper, but he was overruled by the other three referees. <coughs> the editorial board insisted that the paper could not be published unless the, they changed the last words of the title from two degrees Celsius global warming is highly dangerous to two degrees Celsius global warming could be dangerous, an almost meaningless conclusion. The editor, an exceptional scientist, agreed with their position, but was unable to prevail. I wrote an explanation of the public's understanding of the word dangerous. If a person looked down a dark street and saw a bunch of guys loitering and seeming to hold weapons, would that person consider that street to be dangerous and take a different route home, even though there was not 100% proof that he would be assaulted if he went down that street? The editor reported in disappointment that if he included that explanation in a letter to the journal. They couldn't publish ice melt in the journal. Um, so they, they submitted to the demand and they changed it. <coughs> they took it out, right? So this is like the nature of scientific reticence in, on full display. So in ice melt, they used a three-prong analysis to show that continued high emissions would cause shutdown of the uh, North Atlantic overturning circulation, the AMOC, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation and the Southern Ocean overturning circulation, <coughs> Southern meridional overturning circulation. This century, possibly my mid century, sea level rise of several meters on the 50 to 150 year time scale would occur. In Pipeline, we reveal how the reticent community, with full reliance on models that tend to be unrealistically insensitive to freshwater injection alone, could manage to dismiss this result and instead conclude that there was less than a 1% chance of shutting down the AMOC. Okay, so that's what, so they're playing games and they're really ultra conservative, right? And uh, climate doesn't, doesn't give, a, give a rat's ass about all that. It's, it's changing very, very quickly. Um, you know, this is an article today. Um, I listened to the, uh, there's a YouTube video of the press conference uh, <coughs> with um, Columbia. Uh, with Jeffrey Sachs was the moderator, um, and uh, it's an excellent. Um, so just you know, just Google the press conference. I think the video. I don't know if it's been posted online yet. There's also slides associated with it. You can look at, but and you can look at the paper itself. So this is what um, Seth Borenstein he asked um, 
he said, well, Hanson, what do you think about some of the mainstream scientists that are saying that you're, you know, too alarming or whatever, <coughs> right? And he wrote an article. So I'm going to look, I mean, the article is sort of, they're somewhat balanced. Pioneering scientists says global warming is accelerating. Some experts call his claims overheated. Okay. The world isn't just steadily warming, but is dangerously accelerating the warming. Okay. So some other scientists say this is a bit overheated. Okay. So the work from former NASA top scientist James Hansen, who since leaving the space agency has become a prominent protester against the use of fossil fuels, which cause climate change, illustrates a recently surfaced division among scientists about whether global warming is kicked into a new and even more dangerous gear. So he alerted the U.S. to the harms of climate change in dramatic congressional testimony, testimony in 1988. He said, there, he said just uh, today, <coughs> excuse me, that since 2010, the rate of warming has jumped 50%. Since 2010, there is more sun energy, solar energy in the atmosphere, less of the particles, the aerosols that can reflect it back into space, thanks to efforts to cut pollution. The loss of these aerosols means there's less cooling effect. So he says that the Key calculation used in figuring out how much of the world, how much the world will warm in response to carbon pollution shows much faster warming than the UN's IPCC estimates. He called the international goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times deader than a doornail and said a less stringent goal of two degrees is on the, its deathbed. This matters because increases in average global temperature lead to more frequent and intense extreme weather events. The next few years will show that we indeed do have an acceleration in the global warming rate, and it's based on simple, good physics. The planet's now out of energy balance by an incredible amount, more than it's ever been. Um, and of course, you know, so who, who do the media go to? They go to some of the mainstream scientists. Um, and ask them, what do you think about this? And of course, the mainstream scientists express skepticism about Hansen's study, tinged with respect for his long-term work. So his study, <clears throat> um, okay, so, I mean, they give some comments from some other scientists. Hansen's study is broad ranging, but has little by in way of analytical depth or consistency checks when making claims quite far outside the norm, said one guy. It seems primarily aimed at convincing policymakers rather than scientists. And then Michael Mann's always quoted and he'll talk about his book and blah, blah, blah. He says, since 1990, warming is steadily increasing, but not accelerated. This is, this is, this is categorically false. He posted a rebuttal to Hansen's claim, said climate change right now is bad enough and there's no need to overstate the case. He said it's always been risky to ignore Hansen's warnings and admonitions, but when claims are made so far out of the mainstream, the standard for evidence is high, and he says Hansen hasn't met them. Yet a check of NOAA data lends support to Hansen's numbers. Hansen's study said that from 1970 to 2010, the world warmed at a rate of 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade, but he projected that's increased, that would increase to a rate of at least 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade after 2010. The NOAA data shows that 0.27 degrees is the rate since September 2010. That starting date is key because that's when scientists could start to see the effect of clean air regulations. China reduced aerosol pollution. The marine ships reduced the amount of sulfur in fuel, okay, in, in those time periods, okay. Um, so, you know, the, date, the starting date is very important. Um, and then there's, the, the, there's um, the UN climate panel says, that the warming for doubling CO2, um, the range would be two degrees Celsius to five degrees Celsius. So it's like three degrees uh, is, is their medium number for, uh, with the likely range between 2.5 and four degrees, three degrees being a good midpoint. But Hansen's study is it's 4.8 degrees Celsius, plus or minus 1.2. So it's just, that's 3.6 at the minimum 
and, and six degrees Celsius at the highest. Okay, it's much higher than the UN numbers. Okay, so, you know, here's, uh, you know, there, so there's scientists that are saying support for them. Uh, others that say, no, we like the IPCC numbers. I like this one, Rob Jackson, uh, Stanford University climate scientist. He said, I tend to trust Hansen despite his advocacy. I think his contention that the IPCC has underestimated climate sensitivity will prove out. Okay, so, you know, man says the warming the world is seeing is what has long been predicted and is not any indication of something unusual or acceleration. I think he's going to be He's going to be eating his words, and it'll be interesting how he tries to get out of saying, you know, when he's proven wrong in a few years, I'm pretty sure that, you know, he's not going to own up and say, yeah, I was wrong, Hansen, um, Hansen's right. He's just going to change the topic, write another book, et cetera. I'm not very impressed. I, I, I guess it's not so much man. It's the media going to this guy all the time, getting quotes, and that's their, that's crazy. It's easy for them to do. You know, he appears well on the camera, but he says things that seem to be a lot of nonsense to me at the moment. Uh, I would much, I'd say, can't go with Hanson. Um, this is uh, a thread. Leon Simmons was on the, was one of the co-authors. He was saying, James Hanson doesn't shy away of phrasing this clearly. We would be damned fools and bad scientists if we didn't expect an acceleration of global warming. We're beginning to suffer the effect of our Faustian bargain. That is why the rate of global warming is accelerating. Um, and, you know, <laughs> here's an, an image from the paper on sulfates. This is the percentage of the total sulfates from shipping. These are the creating the aerosols. Okay, very high here and here. Uh, and reducing the sulfur from the, sh from the shipping fuels, you'd expect the biggest effect up here. And here, and if you look, this is a change in absorbed solar radiation measured from the NASA Sirius satellite. And you can see this is the North Pacific is this red line. The biggest effect is in the North Pacific. This is the North Atlantic, the, the pinkish line. Very, very sharp uptick in this region here. And this is in the Southern Hemisphere. There's not too many aerosols there because they're generated from industry and shipping. Um, and there's not much change. I mean, this this seems to show, yeah, this is very strong evidence that the change in absorbed solar radiation is actually due to the reduction of aerosols. Okay, so there's lots of stuff on there. Um, and, you know, there's solar ge geoengineering is in there. It's been widely criticized for threatening potential knock-on harm to the environment. Um, but, uh, you know, Hansen and his colleagues, they advocate for a global carbon tax, as well as efforts to intentionally spray sulfur into the atmosphere in order to deflect heat away from the planet and artificially lower the world's temperature. Okay, so cutting emissions should be the highest priority, but because we've been so slow in reducing carbon emissions, uh, we've left it too late. So in order for a bright future, we have to, we need temporary help from solar radiation management. So this is, this is, this is a key factor. Okay, uh, so let's uh, look at the paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline. It's a 33 page paper. Um, and I'm going to, you know, t I'll talk about the abstract and the, the intro and then show you some of the figures. But the key thing is, is that, you know, there's a lot, the climate is a lot more sensitive. The earth is a lot more sensitive than we thought it was. And doubling of CO2 is 4.8 degrees Celsius, much, much higher than what the IPCC is saying. Those are the key, the key points of this paper. Okay, so the abstract. Improved knowledge of glacial to interglacial global temperature change yields the fast feedback called the Charney Equilibrium Climate Sensitivity, ECS, 1.2 plus or minus 0 0.3 degrees Celsius per watt per square meter. That gives you, for doubled CO2, that gives you 4.8 degrees Celsius plus or minus 1.2 degrees Celsius temperature rise for doubled CO2. So that's between 3.6 and 
and 6 degrees Celsius. The IPCC number is between 2.5 and 4 with a, with, a, a mid, with the midpoint of 3 Celsius. So this is way, way higher. Consistent analysis of temperature over the full Cenozoic era. So what's the Cenozoic era? That's since the dinos died off. So, so the last 66 million years ago until today is the Cenozoic era including slow feedbacks of ice sheets and trace gases, supports this sensitivity and implies that CO2 was 300 to 350 parts per million in the Pliocene. Okay, what's the Pliocene? The Pliocene is from 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago. Um, okay, so the, the Pliocene of Pock. Um, and about 450 ppm at transition to a nearly ice-free planet exposing unrealistic lethargy of ice sheet models. I, the models are just getting it wrong, he says, and he's looking at the, at the paleo data, the paleo temperature, if you like. Equilibrium global warming for today's greenhouse gas amount is 10 degrees Celsius, which is reduced to eight degrees Celsius by today's human-made aerosols. Okay, this is, this is huge. Equilibrium warming is not committed warming. Rapid phase out of greenhouse gas emissions would prevent most equilibrium warming from occurring. Okay, that's the long term warming that we could expect with today's greenhouse gas amounts 10 Celsius. Decline of aerosol emissions since 2010 should increase the 1970 to 2010 global warming rate. So the 1970 to 2010 global warming rate is 0 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. Very important to remember that. Since 2010, the rate has been 0 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade. That's what the data shows, and that's what, and, and, and according to Hansen, that will continue going out there. And that's, that's a 50% increase over this number. It could be as high as a doubling of this number. So. The error bars on the curve are 0.7 cells, 0.27 to 0.36, and I've talked about that previous. Thus, under the present geopolitical approach to greenhouse gas emissions, global warming will exceed 1.5 in the 2020s. Well, you know, we're 2023, so we're exceeding it over the next year, and we'll exceed 2 Celsius before 2050, maybe even, you know, much before 2050, I think. Impacts on people and nature will accelerate as global warming increases the hydrologic weather or weather extremes. The enormity of consequences demands a return to Holocene level global temperature for safety. So he's saying that the, they're, they're saying that the actions need, we need a global increasing price on greenhouse gas emissions accompanied by development of abundant, affordable, dispatchable, clean energy, and that includes nuclear. We need east-west cooperation in a way that accommodates developing world needs. And we need intervention with Earth's radiation imbalance to phase down today's massive human-made geotransformation of Earth's climate. So we need intervention. We need solar radiation management. The current political crises present an opportunity for reset, especially if young people can grasp the situation. So it's all geared towards young people. Right. Uh, well, talking about young people, I had a quick look at a couple things here. So I wanted to look at the age of world leaders in 2023. So I went to Google Images and I Googled that. And there's a lot of interesting graphics. And, you know, so I looked a, a couple specifically, you know, um, <coughs> Biden considers re-election bid. Who are the oldest and youngest current world leaders? Okay, so national leaders range in age from the mid 30s to 90. Um, and this is a uh, country's leader, leaders age, you know, different, a bunch of different countries. Trudeau's 51, medium age is 62, uh, China's leader 69, Biden's 80, Putin's uh, 70, Cameroon's uh, leader is the oldest at 90. Right, the medium age is 62. Countries that are less free tend to have older leaders. 
Okay, I, I'm going to argue that we got to, you know, it, we should set a cap on leaders, get rid of all these old fogies. We need younger people because they don't care enough about the future and they don't care enough. Uh, they're too stuck in their ways and, you know, wars result, etc. is is my my argument. Get We need to get rid of all the old fogies, including Biden. Countries ranked less free tend to have older global leaders. So these are free countries, medium age 58. If they're partly free, 61. And if they're not free, okay, if they're very restricted, not democratic countries, the average age of the leader is 69, significantly higher. Women leaders tend to be younger than men leaders. Um, medium for men, 62. Medium for women is 57, but there's much fewer of them. Uh, in most countries, the leader is significantly older than the median member of the population, okay, and, and so on, okay? Interesting. Um, visualize the head of state of each country by age and generation. You know, this is another way of displaying it, you know, with the silent generation, the older guys here. Now look at the, you know, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iran. <coughs> Notice in the Middle East all of these old fogies. Um, and I didn't see uh, Netanyahu on here, but uh, he's, uh, he's 74. Again, you know, these guys are destroying the planet, these old fogies. We need them out. Him, Biden, all the other old fogies. Um, this is an interesting chart here. Um, down here, the oldest and youngest heads of state. So this is the age 90, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iran. Okay, <coughs> we can go, we can go down. Uh, U.S. Biden is there. You know, we can go, keep going down. And I said, what did I say? Uh, I don't know if this is being updated. I don't know if uh, Netan if, if Israel's on here or not. But like I said, Netanyahu is uh, 74. Okay, so there's a theory. Get rid of all the old guys. You know, I've had theories. Get rid of all the men in politics and just put women in, and the world would be a much better place. We could <coughs> address climate change. Anyway, getting back to this paper. Okay, it's a very detailed paper. I've talked about a number of the different components. Um, goes into the history of climate change. You know, we've known since the 1800s that infrared absorbing greenhouse gases warmer surface, that the abundance of greenhouse gases changes naturally as well as from human actions. You know, here's a good quote from Roger Ravel in 1965. He said that we're conducting a vast geophysical experiment by burning fossil fuels that accumulated in Earth's crust over hundreds of millions of years. Um, Charney did a study in 1979 for the <coughs> U.S. Uh, National Academy of Sciences, concluded that doubling of atmospheric CO2 was likely to cause global warming of 3 plus or minus 1.5 Celsius. So that's between 1.5 and 4.5. And then subsequent studies uh, showed it was probably close to the, like a massive study by the National Academy of Sciences um, in uh, about 1980 um, called Changing Climate. Um, basically said the number was closer to the lower bounds of the Charney. So this is what the IPCC is saying right now about this number. What Hansen is saying is it's 4.8 plus or minus 1.2. Okay, they also got it wrong. They thought that the um, delay of global warming caused by ocean thermal inertia is 15 years, and that's completely wrong. Okay, with that assumption, they concluded that climate sensitivity for doubling of CO2 was near or below the low end of Charney's 1.5 to 4.5 range. This was believed for about 40 years. Okay, and it caused huge damage because that's totally ridiculous. It's more like a hundred years, the delayed response. Okay, so, you know, he talks about the climate sensitivity and the earth system sensitivity. So the ECS is, um, is basically fast feedbacks. 
And then the general earth sensitivity is over long periods of time with longer feedbacks, okay? So Charney defined ECS as the eventual global temperature change caused by doubled CO2 if ice sheets, vegetation, and long-lived greenhouse gases are fixed, except for CO2 doubling. Other quantities affecting Earth's energy balance, clouds, aerosols, water vapor, snow cover, and sea ice change rapidly in response to climate change. Okay, so this ECS from Charney is the fast feedback climate sensitivity, but there's many other interactions like the ice sheets, et cetera, you know, slow feedbacks, which, are, which need to be incorporated or played out, and that gives you the ESS number, the Earth's uh, sensitivity or system sensitivity number. Okay, so he, he talks about some of the climate sensitivities over time and some of the feedbacks and the IPCC numbers, etc. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details in the math. So the point is, is uh, you know, is is uh, the total greenhouse gas forcing in this paper is calculated, you know, from the CO2, the methane, the nitrous oxide. Um, and other greenhouse gases, and you can plot it and compare it to the, the IPCC number, and they're very, very close. So this is the equation for in this paper, which I just showed you, and this is the IPCC AR6, the latest uh, number. So that's a total greenhouse gas forcing. Um, this, is a, this is going back 800,000 years in Antarctic uh, ice core measurement showing the temperature fluctuating with the glacier, glacials and interglacials. This is the last, uh, the previous interglacial, the Eemian. Here we are in the Holocene. Okay, so from the change of temperature to the last glacial maximum, um, this is, uh, <coughs> this is going, so this is the, this is the Eemian, and this is the la end of the, the last ice age, the, the the lowest temperature was about 20,000 years ago, 21,000 years ago or so. So the temperature change from then to now, or then was, is about, was about seven degrees Celsius. And, and you can calculate the forcings from the, et cetera. So that brings a, a basically um, a, a range, the Holocene to last glacial maximum range, 1.2 Celsius plus or minus 0.3 Celsius per watt per square meter. Okay, um, and uh, from the temperature of seven degrees, we can then get the, uh, the, the sensitivity, basically. Okay, uh, and then climate response time, and now what's going on with the Earth energy imbalance, um, right? So there's lots of data, there's lots of different feedbacks, there's information on deep ocean temperatures and sea levels. You know, as we go back through the Cenozoic, so this is a this is the entire Cenozoic era, um, the Paleocene, Eocene, Olig Oligocene, and Miocene. The last interglacial is the Eemian. I may have called it the Eocene by mistake. I'm not sure. Sometimes I do that. So this is a this is the Paleo Eocene thermal maximum, a spike here. This is the um, early Eocene climate optimum, EEC, e, this is when the uh, ice formed in Antarctica. Um, this is the um, Miocene climate optimum and so on as we go through. So from this, from all these changes, we can get a really good handle on what the climate sensitivity is. Um, right, so there's lots of data and calculations and so on. And, and this is, don't forget, uh, you know, this is, this is interesting. This is what the Earth looked like 56 million years before present. Okay, so India was out here as a big island, and of course it rammed up. You know, we didn't have the Himalayas here. India rammed up. You know, the two plates collided. It drove up the Himalayan mountains. Um, you know, there's also, you know, you can see there seems to be an open channel here between uh, North America and South America, that closed off about 3 million years ago, I believe. Um, Australia is down here. Uh, there's, uh, there was a connection here between South America and Antarctica here, which really affected the ocean currents in the Southern, southern uh, Hemisphere. 
etc. So there you can see subtle differences. It's very interesting to, to look at that. The continental shells were underwater because there was little water locked in ice. The Indian plate was moving north at about 15 centimeters per year, zipping fast. <coughs> okay, so, you know, he talks about the different forcings for the different feedbacks, etc. So basically, we use the uh, paleothermometer to figure out um, what the equilibrium climate sensitivity and the earth system sensitivity are. Um, and today's human-made greenhouse gas forcing, 4.6 watts per square meter, growing about half a watt per square meter per decade, is already at least comparable to the Paleo-Eocene thermal maximum forcing. Okay, um, and then the role of aerosols. So this is, uh, this is the observed global temperature here. This is a greenhouse, it, with greenhouse gas warming with an equilibrium climate sensitivity of 1.2, which is the best number that Hansen uh, argues in this paper, and they calculated from the paleothermometer. That would give a curve like this. Um, and we don't see that, we see this. So this blue is the Faustian bargain. This blue is the cooling from aerosols, which is hugely significant. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about the sea level rise, ambiguity, aerosol offset as a percentage of greenhouse gas forcings, and so on. Okay, uh, I want to go, okay, so these are the aerosols. This is very important. This is the, um, this is the change in temperature in the different models um, and data. Total sulfate, mostly in the northern hemisphere, right? Remember the sulfate? creates the aerosols, and then there's a direct effect where they cause some cooling by shielding, blocking incoming solar radiation, and then there's an indirect effect where they act as cloud condensation nuclei and generate clouds that are brighter and have smaller particles because there's more aerosols, and therefore the clouds are longer lived and provide, uh, the lo they're low level clouds and they provide some cooling to the planet. This is the percentage of sulfate from shipping. And, uh, you know, of course, we've, I've talked about the, this is the global absorbed solar radiation anomaly greatly increasing. And uh, this, is the, this is the anomaly globally is the blue and in the southern hemisphere. So it's mostly in the northern hemisphere, right? Because the sulfates that are being removed are, there's very few to begin with in the southern hemisphere. The one that we're lowering the sulfur content in shipping, so it's mostly a northern hemisphere effect. And that's borne out in, in all of the data. <coughs> um, this is the absorbed solar radiation anomaly in the North Pacific, is the blue line going way up, and in the North Atlantic is the red line going way up. And again, you know, look in the North Pacific and North Atlantic, that's where most of the aerosols uh, are from shipping. So removing the sulfate from shipping fuels means that there's a reduction of the aerosols and we would expect these regions to warm greatly because they're absorbing a lot more energy and that's happening. Okay, so um, the earth energy imbalance. Um, okay, so this is the, um, th this, this plot here you've seen before from previous videos. The warming uh, from 1970 to 2010, the best fit is 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. Bang, 2010, everything changed. Okay, the rate's been rising up, and this is, the, it's between these two numbers. This is a 50% increase in that rate. To, so the lower line is 0 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade, and that's what we've been following since 2010. And the upper line is 0 0.36 which is, uh, you know, we're expecting the warming to ramp up and be in that um, range. Okay, so that's a key, key factor. And it's because the Earth energy imbalance is taking off like crazy. So here's what it was. Um, this is the, uh, this is the floor here where it was, it was about 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 um, from about 2005 to 2015. <coughs> and then it ramped up to 
and it ramped up to 1.36. And it spiked up, it's almost, the spike has almost reached uh, two watts per square meter. So it's phenomenal rise in a very short period of time. And um, the CO2, uh, this is CO2 from fossil fuel emissions. Um, this, the blue is the CO2 appearing in the atmosphere. A lot of it is being absorbed. Uh, it's disappearing. It's being absorbed in the oceans. It's being taken up in the ocean and land. Okay, so uh, global energy consumption, you know, still rising like crazy. Global C CO2 emissions still rising like crazy. A little blip, COVID blip. Um, it, most of the global emissions are from emerging economies. It's shooting up. It's flattened out in mature economies. So most of it is you know, in emerging economies, talks about the scientific reticence of, you know, being as being a huge problem. You know, some of the psychological reasons why, you know, the penalty for crying wolf is immediate to scientists, while the danger of being blamed for fiddling while Rome was burning is distant. Right. And, uh, you know, there's some historical examples of this. Right. It's just huge reticence. You know, he talks about the ice melt paper and stuff like that. It's really good reading. It's very important, I think, that you, you know, have that you read it. I mean, if there's sections that you don't understand, which there will be, just skip over them. Make sure you, you know, you read these parts for sure on on reticence, on climate change responsibility. You know, who's created the emissions? Right, the UK initially, and then other countries took over. Right, really good. Cumulative emissions by the U.S. is huge. I mean, we blame China. Well, it's it's much, much lower. You know, European countries, much, much higher. I mean, the cumulative emissions, tons of carbon per person from 1751 to 2020. You know, look at Canada is huge. UK, really large. Germany, you know, high. Russia over here. Rest of Europe. Right, the global mean is like really low, you know. And here's the, uh, you know, here, <coughs> here's the change of watts per square meter per year. So in a decade, multiplied by ten, it's about 0.5 watts per square meter in a decade. So when we talk about the collapse of aerosols, making you know the forcing going up, you know, one or two watts per square meter. Right, that's huge. That's of course there's going to be a massive acceleration of of warming. So he talks about politics and climate change and so on. I mean, he covers everything. This is a this is a landmark paper. It's a key paper. It's complex, but it's vital that you have a look at this paper. You know, lots of it have 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 appeared in previous articles and stuff by Hansen, but it's all put together in one place and published in a peer reviewed journal and don't listen to mainstream scientists and and uh you know who are saying well you know don't take to read too much into this paper this paper is explaining what is happening with temperatures on our planet why ocean temperatures are skyrocketing why storms are skyrocketing you know why all why we're in a supercharged atmosphere you know things are totally different now so, you know, it's an awesome paper. Um, and, you know, I was knocking all of the old politicians, of course, you know, I should point out, you know, Hanson is 82 years old himself, right? It's okay to have old scientists doing this work, but you can't have old politicians setting policy when they're, when they're ancient and they're not going to live for much longer because the policies, you know, like, what do they care? They don't, they're not going to live much longer and, you know, they might, care about their grandkids and kids but we don't know that they have the humanity uh, the best for humanity in, in mind some of them are just clinging to power um, who might that be uh, this guy here in particular I think uh, remember the massive protests against the hard right uh, policies of the Israeli government you know just like a month or two ago don't forget what happened when you're trying to figure out what's going on now with the uh, you know, the, the terrible massacre that's going on. So anyway, um, yeah, it's okay to have scientists this old, right? But not, not politicians. 
anyway, thank you for listening. Um, you know, please make sure you go to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and uh, donate at my PayPal account to support my research and videos. <coughs> you know, I make sure that you download this paper. Um, it's not behind a paywall or anything. If, you, if you're on Twitter or X, you can follow me. I post the links and stuff. Um, and there's a YouTube video I, I, that will be posted of the press conference. It was from about 10 to 11, 15 or so this morning um, at Columbia University, um, moderated by um, the famous Jeffrey Sachs. And Hansen was speaking, and then um, some of the other authors were speaking, um, like uh, Leon was, was speaking and uh, Pushkar, you know, was talking, um, and a few of the, uh, there was a, another one, um, I think it might have been George here, um, but anyway, that's, uh, you know, the, the, that, th there's a video, it's, a, it's a 75 minutes long, and it's talking all about this paper with slides, etc. Uh, very important stuff. Anyway, this is the key number, 4.8 Celsius plus or minus 1.2, and the rate of warming has greatly taken off since 2010, and we know why. It's a, it's a reduction of aerosols. So thanks again for listening, and uh, we'll chat soon. You may have noticed that I'm wearing my James Hansen or slash uh, Gilligan uh, cap, right, in, in solidarity for James Hansen and, and this uh, incredible paper that he, he just released today. Thanks again, and uh, bye for now.